So, now the lecture number six that has uh, as a topic European civilization. Uh, so we are uh, now we put aside other Indo-European society and we concentrate on European history and European cultures and European people. So now it is clear that uh, European civilization is uh, based on this su superposition of two uh, essential horizons and has as its center and the main problem, the problem of Dionysus and its interpretation. So that uh, European history is Titanomachia or Noomachia and the basic, basic um, conditions of this that Titanomachia was this, the fact of this uh, coming of Turanian in the European uh, uh, cultures uh, uh, with Kurgan culture in the field of the Great Mother civilizations or civilization of Great Mother. Speaking about Dionysus in the previous lecture, uh, we have we have identified that Dionysus is the main problem this civilization and that is the battlefield, battleground where there is uh, the Titanomachia develop, uh, uh, developing. And I have mentioned as well the case of Thrakia. Thrakia. The Thrakian people, uh, Thrakian people was uh, people uh, of Turanian type, first of all, in the European people that came to the Balkans uh, before the Slavs, uh, maybe 1,200 years uh, before Christ, uh, maybe a little bit later, maybe earlier, that's difficult to say, but what is important, that was a kind of empire of the Thracian tribes, many tribes, Thracian tribes, they lived in the Balkans, in the northern Balkans, but they occupied the, almost the, the huge part of the Eastern Europe. And what is important that the, the territories where the Thracian civilization was uh, based, was expanded, these, these territories were the poles and the centers of the uh, civilization of Great Mother. Uh, so, uh, Lepensky Vir Vinci culture uh, and uh, uh, Karanova Gumenica culture, Tripoli Kukuteni, uh, Krish, Tisa culture, and all, all other, other cultures were. Uh, under uh, under uh, existential horizon of Thracians. So that is, we don't know and we could know whether the Thracians were the first Indo-Europeans coming over these territories. But we don't know the more ancient groups in the European. Maybe and possibly, probably, there were the other waves of Turanian peoples coming there. Maybe not. We could not say. But uh, Thracian culture was precisely the field or special European culture where this meeting between uh, Horizon of Apollo and Logos of Apollo and Logos of Sibili uh, was accomplished. So that was the, the culture of meeting and Slavic tribes that came much later in the Balkans, they have assimilated in, and included the Thracian elements inside of, the, of uh, their, their uh, structure. So Thracian 
uh, as well, there is a very, very important uh, aspect that Dionysus, what was considered by the Greeks to be Thracian god, whether that was really Thracian or pre-Thracian, or by some Indo-European people that preceded Thracian in the Balkans, we don't know, but that is very important that Dionysus came from the north to the Greece, from the Thracian, as well as Orpheus, as well as Bendis. Bendis, that was uh, the name for a great mat mother in the Greeks as well, Bendis, and Kokito, the, the other name. They were the, the other names of Sibylli. So, uh, the Thracian tradition as well, uh, the <coughs> Phrygians were Thracian, uh, close to Thracians, Thracians. and Phrygians uh, were uh, the civilization, uh, was the people uh, where the Sibylli cult was developed. So, uh, that as well has something to do with the Thracian world. Uh, that was, uh, so it is possible that Thracian uh, tribes were more ancient, that we know, that we presume, and maybe they were the first. Maybe not, we could not affirm. Uh, but they were what is certain, in the European society with very developed nomadic aspect and more to the north, more nomadic they were, more to the Transylvania, to, um, to the Romania, act, uh, that was already, uh, already the steppes and Eurasian, Turanian space. Uh, but they, uh, what is certain, that Thracians were uh, here uh, around uh, Dunai River and uh, Basin and in Balkans before Scythes uh, uh, and Sarmats, long before. So uh, that, is, that is very ancient, very ancient in the European culture that has assimilated and included the pre in the European, Paleo European tradition or directly or by intermediary, by some other in the European society. So we could not say nothing affirmative here, but what is important that regarding the Slav horizon of Eastern Europe, that dominated Eastern Europe as civilization um, in the, in the, uh, after 5th and 6th century, when the Eastern Europe was invaded by Slavs, before the coming of Slavs, the Thracian civilization was here, and that was in the European. And maybe the, the meeting between uh, Logos of Apollo and Logos of Sibylli was precisely in Thracia. And there's the other important thing that, if so, so. European peasantry uh, expanded from the same region. So the Balkan, Balkan space was the motherland or heimat for not only for Eastern European peasantry, peasantry, but as well for all European peasantry, because the uh, uh, agricultural tradition was developed much earlier, precisely in the fertile uh, territories of Balkans, where this matriarchal uh, society existed long before coming of Turanian culture. So, uh, Eastern Europe that is considered to be a periphery or border of Europe or something the marginal to the Greece, to the afterwards to the Western Europe, maybe was central one. So, we need to, to consider more um, this Eastern European uh, space as existential space. We need to pay more attention to this Eastern European design and uh, existential horizon of Eastern Europe. Uh, it is complicated, complex, with many tribes, many people, many, many levels of, of the culture, but uh, what is very important, uh, 
that is the Thracian origins of Dionysus and Orpheus. That, in the perspective that I have explained about the central role of the figure of Dionysus as a key to the historical sequence of European history or to ontology of European history, the Eastern Europe obtains new dimension and new importance. It, is, it was not in the reality periphery of the other Greek, Roman, uh, uh, later uh, West, uh, Western European civilization. That was, that was something polar in uh, Eastern Europe, Europe, in Balkans, that was a kind of center, a pole, but the quality in the nature, no logical nature of this pole, we need to study more. So not to be only proud to be Balkanian Slavs living here after the Frankians, uh, but what is important is to, to understand the structure, the levels, the knowledge of, of, of this space. And because the, the problem of Dionysus is central and so important, as I tried to explain, so the, uh, the role of the Eastern Europe as well uh, is growing. And that we could uh, deduce from that uh, one important thing. We could deduce that we know East Europe, Eastern Europe, Thracian, Slavic, Balkanic space as a kind of continuation or result or periphery of the Western Europe and Eurasia, Russia or uh, uh, Turanian, Turanian space. <coughs> but there is absolutely new kind Dionysian kind of Eastern Europe, where this uh, meeting that is key event in the ontological and semantical history of the Western Europe uh, was produced. So Eastern Europe is not the periphery, is in some way the center and the pole. And regardless as such, but in a very special way, not in the any way. So, uh, but regardless of such, we need to concentrate more on the motherland of Dionysus, because it is precisely the motherland of Dionysus. And the factor of Thracian language and Thracian culture, uh, and uh, the only pure Thracian god, Zalmoxis, that uh, is known, uh, we need to pay more attention to this figure, and there are many, many, uh, many parallels, many common, common aspects between Zalmoxus and Dionysus. So, Mircea Lede and Romanian tradition uh, paid great attention to the, the figure of Zalmoxus and uh, its uh, role in the uh, Thracian horizon. So, the Thracian culture, as well as a matriarchal uh, culture before of Thracian, before Thracians, uh, the, um, of uh, the civilization of uh, Eastern European great mother didn't disappear. It has entered into the peasant tradition, Eastern European, and expanded with the peasantry through all of Europe. So that is very interesting. Where we, are, where, where we have the peasants in Europe, we have the uh, uh, continuator, the descendants from the Balkanian, Balkanic, Balkanian, Balkanian motherlands. So we could speak about peasant design, special kind of third function that conserved cultural lines of pre-Indo-European tradition and one of the first in the European society that has integrated these elements were Thracians and after, their, after them all, all, the, uh, all the other. 
Maybe we should pay special attention to Illyrians as well, because they lived here with uh, to the, uh, the Western Balkans uh, with Thracians, and according to some historians, the, the space of Illyrians reached uh, to the Baltic uh, Sea. So they maybe Illyrians lived as well uh, far to the north before the Slav uh, came there. But we, we know too, too little about these two, two people, but we could deduce some things uh, starting um, interpreting correctly uh, Southern Slavic tradition, <coughs> because there is continuity, cultural continuity, because all the peasants we know, maybe in, uh, uh, after a thousand of years of, um, in the Europeanization, they were originally Balkanic. So peasantry is Balkanic and peasant design, peasant tradition is in the roots, in the, in the depth Balkanic. So that is uh, uh, very, uh, very important. So um, uh, now we could consider European space and to say some words uh, about different, different, uh, less lesser existential horizon of. Uh, the great European space. As, as we have said already, there is the huge Indo-European Turanian space that includes almost all Eurasia, from the um, British islands to the uh, India. And that is the greatest uh, Indo-European uh, existential horizon. There is European existential horizon on the west, west western but European including, uh, that includes uh, as well Eastern Europe. But we could as well uh, change the scale of knowledge and geosophy and try to, 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 to consider the, uh, the lesser on the lesser scale. Uh, but now we know what we are what we are seeking for. We are seeking that how each society solved or is solving the problem of Dionysus. So that now our our search is much more concrete, trying to, to understand or decipher or interpret hermeneutically one on other. European culture, we are searching the knowledgeal balance and the moment of noomachia in any society. So, for example, starting with uh, uh, Greek uh, tradition, the Greek tradition it is based uh, on the uh, absolute victory of the logos of Apollo, but. This victory, as I have mentioned yesterday, was not immediate. So Hellenistic tribes, Aeolian, Ionian, uh, uh, came to the Balkan and the, to the Peloponnese in the waves, uh, controlling or um, overcoming uh, the uh, existing matriarchal civilization. But at the same time, the, there was exchange of the elements, and the, the, uh, some uh, Greek uh, territories conserved this in the European vertical, trifunctional, purely patriarchal structure, and some <laughs> have lost it because, or some some elements. So we we had. Uh, Minoan and Mycenaean cultures, where there was the mixture between uh, patriarchy and patriarchy elements. And only the last wave of the, of the Hellenic tribes coming from the north, from the Macedonia, Dorian, Dorian wave, the fourth tribe of Hellenic, brought with itself decisive Apollonism, decisive pastoralism and destroyed Mycenaean culture 
and introduced the purely Turanian style. And that was that was very very important. That uh, that is reflected in the Sparta. That is more Dorian than Ionian Athens, and the dualism of uh, Greek culture between Sparta and Athens uh, is uh, uh, Athens was Ionian, and Sparta was Dorian, and that was as well the uh, dualism of the balance of Malmachia, because in Sparta the logos of Apollo was clearer and uh, uh, more powerful. And uh, in Ionia and Eolia uh, in Athens, in the uh, Anatolian uh, Greek uh, um, uh, Greek colonies, uh, the, the power of this vertical logos of Apollo uh, was lesser. So that is important. That in Greece as well, there were the kind of differences of uh, uh, existential horizons. And the dualism between Sparta and Athens, that is the key dualism in the geopolitics, as well has no logical and geosophical uh, interpretation and explanation. So, uh, the next, uh, the next uh, m moment, that, uh, and uh, Dionysus was Greek god as well, with Thra Thracian origins, but it was uh, purely Greek, because that was the um, around him uh, that were that was Apollonian uh, perspective and very ancient Sibelian uh, uh, space and in Greek culture in the worship and the religion of polytheistic religion in philosophy we see uh, this uh, this element very really, uh, clearly. I would uh, I would like to mention that. I have already said that uh, that uh, could be the logos. All three of them could be reflected in the religion and the myth, but as well in the philosophy. And the logos of Apollo is reflected in the perfect, in the almost absolute, the best way in the Apo Platonic uh, philosophy. Platonic philosophy is a, a absolute version of the logos of Apollo. As well as logic of Aristotle, that was the disciple, disciple of Plato, and his part of his teaching of Aristotle, as well, we see the logos of Apollo in the purest and formalized uh, uh, version. There was the logos of Dionysus in Heraclitus, that is dialectic, that is, uh, as we have called that, uh, the dramatic nocturne. That is Heraclitus' philosophy that is based on the cycle, on the war, on the cycle, on this di dialectic between eternal and what is in time. Uh, and, uh, but that is not materialist. So Heraclitian uh, belongs to the Dionysian aspect. As well, the part of the teaching of Aristotle, physics and rhetorics, belong as well to Dionysian. Logos, because they are dealing with a paradox of two in one, a form and matter in one thing. The thing is double and is one. So that is, that is not Apollonian. Uh, Apollonian is one is one. One that is that and not the other. If there is something that is that, is that and other, we are dealing already with, we are shifting to Dionysus. So, uh, that is the great error to uh, consider the physics of Aristotle as the logic of Aristotle. But there is two vision in Aristotle. There is Apollonian side of Aristotle that is logic, and that is the Anisian side of Aristotle uh, that is physics. And what is interesting, uh, uh, we are dealing with completely erroneous understanding of Aristotelism because we are trying to apply logic to physics <laughs> but uh, and we are working with physical mathematical object there is not su su such object in the reality there is mathematical object that is purely Apollonian and there is physical object that is purely Dionysian 
Dionysian. So, from that follows very important remark that in order to study the physical world, we need to apply not the logic to this world, but rhetoric. And rhetoric will be more strict science and more precise science of the physics. We need to use Heraclitian concepts, dialectics, rhetorics. Rhetorics, it is a kind of violation of the law of the logic. In rhetoric, we are seeing the things that don't correspond exactly to what we, uh, to what we pronounce. That is irony. Uh, irony is the main figure main, uh, of rhetorics. Irony. So we are saying one thing, but, but we are meaning the other thing. For Slavs, it's very clear. Our language is rhetoric, uh, ironic. We are living in an ironical culture. We never say what we mean. We, we say one thing, mean other, make uh, third, and with the result, the result is fourth. Uh, heterotelic. Oh, uh, that is a classical, rhetorical, ironical society. Well, we are ironical people. All our speech is based on irony. Uh, but irony is the main figure of the rhetorics. So irony is violation of the laws of, lo of logic. For example, metony metonymy. Metonymy is the figure that we say as how many uh, heads of cattle we have. So, for example, metonymy. But we mean cows or bulls, not uh, or sheep, not the heads of, of, of them. But we are using uh, the part as a whole. It's rhetoric. But it is violation of, of, of the logic, violation, where we are counting heads. Uh, and all, all rhetoric figures are such. For example, we are saying one thing, meaning something other. Synecdoche and uh, antiphrase uh, uh, and all the other rhetoric figures. But they cover the, the physical reality exactly. So, but logically, Logically, we could not uh, uh, gain uh, such precision just because the physical object but not belong to the intellectual object, to mathematical. They are not. They, there is not physical mathematical. Uh, we could, with logic, we could study mathematical and geometrical uh, objects, but physical object we should start. We should uh, study it with different rhetorical methods and that only uh, only this rhetorical method could be uh, strict and precious precious um, and uh, could be um, uh, precise precise sorry enough in order to cover the dialectical structure of the object the thing is rhetorical and not logical that's very important. And that is all that in Aristotle. I suggest uh, you reading of early texts of Heidegger about Aris, uh, Aristotle, as well as Aristotelian studies of uh, early Husserl and Brentano, because the phenomenological tradition in philosophy uh, stressed this Aristotelian aspect, uh, ignored by the previous tradition. So they have rediscovered, phenomenologists have rediscovered this in uh, Aristotle. But there was as well in Greece, we are speaking now about Greece, um, uh, Greek existential space, there was as well the third logos. Uh, this uh, logos of Sibylle represented philosophical, not only in the uh, mis uh, mystery of great mother, and this philosophical tendency of ancient Greece was represented by Democritus by Epicurus and in Rome by, by Lucretius. Lucretius. Uh, these three authors uh, were typically representatives by ancient materialist and immanentist uh, tradition because uh, for them there was not uh, there were no um, patriarchal um, principle everything uh, uh, consist uh, from at atoms, uh, so there th that was a kind kind of uh, 
purely and as well they they uh, pr uh, professed uh, above all Epicurus and Lucretius m progress the concept of progress that everything is going in the positive way from the uh, lesser uh, to the to the to the better from the evil to the good so that was the concept that everything is growing from from uh, from the bottom to, 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 to the top so that purely the concept of the progress of evolution is purely titanic that was uh, materialism uh, materialistic titanic version of the cosmos so Three logos were present in Greek philosophy, but well, that's important. <coughs> normative logos were considered to be logos of Apollo, Platonism, partly Aristotle, and uh, Her uh, Heraclitus. Dark logos, but as well accepted. And the Democritus and uh, Epicurus uh, at the lesser scale were rejected. Plato suggested to, uh, to burn the, the, the book of uh, Democritus because that was considered a, a very dangerous heresy. In philosophy it could be as well heresy. That was, that was the continuation, now we see that clear, of Indo-European Titanomachia or no machia, and the moment of, the, of Greek culture of no machia was based over on the victory, on the victory of the Logos of Apollo with the friendship and alliance of Logos of Apollonian Dionysus over this materialistic Sibirian Logos. So, but that is more or less, in some words, uh, explanation of Greek, uh, Greek tradition. And uh, uh, inner dualism was represented in the dualism Sparta, Sparta and Athens. What is it important? That is Hellenistic time. Everything is changed, or many things uh, were changed during Hellenistic times after the Alexander the Great. During Alexander the Great, the Greece has expanded its control over completely new existential horizon. That was Iranian existential horizon. That was included in the Mediterranean and Greek culture, and that created the phenomenon of Hellenism. So Hellenis, Hellenic is one thing, Hellenistic is other thing. What, where lays the difference between two culture, two existential horizon, two culture, uh, Hellenic is uh, uh, Greek, as we have explained that, and Hellenistic is Greek plus not Orient, not Eastern, not Asian, as we say, not Semitic, as we usually say, but precisely Iranian existential space. So, not vague something or orientalistic. Uh, Hellenism is regarded as Greek plus something oriental. If we study correctly this phenomenon of, of Hellenistic civilization, we discover very important thing. The Hellenism is strictly Greece plus Iran, not Greece plus Egyptian, Semitic, Eastern, Indian, in the general uh, sense. Iranian. Because Iranian civilization was not only the culture of Iran. That was culture of Achaemenidian Empire that included in itself as well Egypt, Semitic tradition and transformed in its Iranian logos all these ancient culture. There was the common denominator in this Ahmadid uh, cultural tradition, existential horizon, 
And that, uh, all that I have um, explained in my book, The Logos of Iran, Iranian Logos, uh, Iran has included all the previous uh, cultures and transformed in, in the context of its own dominating Zoroastrian Mazdaian concept. So we are dealing with Egypt, with Semitic world, with Babylonia, after a Hamanid empire, not directly, but through Iranian concept. So they were Iranized, what we are calling Egyptian Semitic Babylonian, in the reality, were Iranized version of this tradition. So I distinguish, I suggest to distinguish Iranian and Iranistic, as we are distinguishing Hellenic and Hellenistic. So Achaemenid Empire was not purely Iranian, but that was not exclusively Iranian, that was inclusively Iranian, that included the other tradition, but transformed semantically it in the context of Iranian laws. So, in the Hellenism, that was a kind of hair uh, and Alexander uh, Macedonian has received the heritage of this Iranism in full scale because the empire of Alexander, Hellenistic empire, was the same as Achaemenidian empire plus Greece. Uh, but that heritage is almost always uh, ignored. So. Or they say uh, or Alexander Macedonian has received Oriental heritage, <coughs> not Iranian, because we we consider this uh, acquisition of the new territories and uh, conquests of Alexander the Great with Greek eyes. In that in that sense, we are all all, all Greeks. We consider we European, Russian, Serbian. French, uh, German, we are Greek because for us Greek history is our history, Iranian history is the history of other. But never we consider Iranian history as our history. So that was conquest of us against them. And they were not so clearly distinguished. So we, we, we should uh, uh, overcome them include the cultures, but we, 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 we don't, uh, we don't uh, go into the details of what we have acquired. They, are, they were conquer, conquered uh, culture. But if we consider that in optic, uh, in the perspective, perspective of Iranians, everything changed. There was a kind of Iranian logos. And what was the, the essence of Iranian logos that we should include in our understanding of what is European civilization because of Hellenism? And I will, I will explain why it's so important, why Hellenism is so important. So, Iranian logos is based on the main principles. First of all, that is the war of light. So that is radical dualistic, as we have said yesterday, dualistic Platonism. So the Logos of Apollo against the, uh, the Logos of uh, Sibylli, but recognizing the power and the substance and the autonomous nature of this second Logos. So that is not only as in Advaita Platonism, as non-dualist Platonism, uh, the, 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 uh, the darkness is the absence of light. No, the darkness in Iranian concept is living thing, is powerful thing, is winning thing. For Plato, to suggest that the evil can, can win the good is absurd. It's absolutely impossible. Because in the world, world of Apollo and Logos of Apollo, there is the eternal victory of the light over, over darkness. Darkness doesn't exist. In the Iranian version, 
Darkness exists. Darkness is God, but the other God. So the night is. The night is powerful and night can win. So there is and the, la the fight between them is for the first time comparing to the Platonist and Logos of Apollo is serious and something dramatic, something that you can lose. So that is completely different attitude toward uh, life. That is Apol uh, Apollonist, Apollonian. So uh, Iranian, to, uh, to be Iranian is to be the bearer of light for the Iranians. So there is not no other definition of Iranian. Iranian is the sun of light put into the field of the darkness in order to fight. So it's extremely dramatical version of Logos of Apollo with recognition of the substance and the reality and the power of the Logos of Sibiri. So it is uh, er, uh, Iran purely and uh, in Iranian self-consciousness uh, uh, Iranian identity is based on the concept that only Iranians are pure the people of light <coughs> and all the rest including Turanians are people of darkness so that is a kind of metaphysical racism in Iranian tradition purity and that was the situation of the permission of the incest Incest is strictly prohibited in any kind of, of culture, in any, in uh, primitive, in developed, not in the Iranian, because the, 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 the concern to, con to conserve the purity of the Iranian soul, Iranian body, Iranian uh, uh, blood was so great that, that, that overweighted the prohibition of the incest and the marriage between the sister and brother, or son and mother. That's almost incredible in archaic society and developed society. But in Iranian, uh, Iranian society, that was, per, uh, that was permitted. Or, and that was almost obligation in order to save this purity of the son of light. So that is extreme version of the, the of, uh, Logos of Apollo. But that is Iran, Iranian tradition. But Iranism included Egyptian, Semitic, um, Babylonian, and other people. So that was not so much exclusive as Iranian. Iranism is a kind of symbolical uh, transfer of this quality of Son of Light, not from the direct Iranian bodily concrete, material in some way, understanding of what is the light and what is the sun of the light, as a kind of metaphoric sun of light. So, Iranism is not Iranian, it is not so exclusive, it, it in, embeds in itself the other, other tradition. So, the, the, uh, the concept of uh, war of light is accepted in the broader sense. After that, uh, the other concept of uh, um, Iranian tradition that wasn't known by the Greek society is idea of time and idea of history. Because for in the Platonic version there is no history, there is no time as something important. There is always the same, just the same, the cycle of the, the birth and the, the death of the same. That is eternal return of the thing that is purely platonic with no reason, with no development, with no progress, with no regress. There is a completely different time. You come, come from the origin, from the source, you return to the source, that's all. And what is going on in this uh, sublunar cycles has no matter, no logic, no sense, no direction, no time, no history. So there is eternity, the history of eternity. The Platonic history is the history of eternity, and the time is a reflection of eternity, so it doesn't exist in the sense that is common to us. But only in Iranian tradition, 
the time obtains the meaning because the Iranian tradition affirms that in the beginning there was the light over darkness and the second stage of Iranian historical sequence the darkness has interrupted and uh, in, has invaded the realm and the field of light and began to destroy and deviate and pervert the world of light and at the next moment the darkness will overcome the light will win the light and at the end of the rule of the darkness there will be the great restoration resurrection and appearance of the chosen one that will be the king and the savior of the humanity so there appears the time because now the time matters in in Plato, Plato the time doesn't matter it's nothing there is no no, no logic and here appears the history, here appears the time and eschatology, here appears messianism, the messiah, here appears the last king of the world that should appear and restore the realm and the kingdom of light as the, the last result of the fight of the uh, war of light and there is resurrection resurrection of the lost perfection of the creation of light that is Iranism but we are dealing with that as something completely uh, completely uh, close to us but all that was completely unknown to the Greek so it is purely Iranian influence so history time Resurrection, eschatology, the, the meaning of the, of the time. The, in Greek, Platonic world, the time has no meaning at all. The only, only, uh, only return to, to, to the origin has meaning. So the time, the history, that's um, nothing. Or only the example of the past, uh, of the heroes in order to repeat them. So uh, 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 the heroes of the past, they function they are functioning as paradigms as the ideas and here appears the uh, history a little later uh, please uh, here appears the history here manifests itself a completely new perspective Iranian perspective and after conquers or conquests of uh, Alexander the Great that spiritual, philosophical and metaphysical heritage entered into the Mediterranean Greek culture that was outside became inside, inner there is a kind of idea that the time the messianism, the history uh, uh, was uh, all that were uh, brought by Jews, by Semitic, by the Bible. But we know the Bible only after Babylonian captivity. So, but Babylonian captivity and the end of Babylonian captivity that was the Achaemenid Empire, Achaemenid Empire that distributed these Iranian logos including among the Jews so the late Judaism that we know and that it is linked with the concept of Messiah of the end of time resurrection is some Iranian reduction of the purely Semitic uh, original Judaism so uh, uh, the, the time the history was Iranian and was Hellenistic so Hellenism it's so important for European culture for any European uh, existential horizon because 
it is precisely based on two pillars, two conceptual pillars, not on one. It is not the Greek Hellenic culture and something Oriental or Semitic. There is Greek and Iranian. The Hellenism is Iranism at the same time. And Hellenistic culture and Hellenistic world was, pre was precisely the uh, space, existential space, that created Hellenistic design. Hellenistic design was the basis of European culture of the next, next stage. What is important? First of all, this Hellenistic space and design was uh, uh, has changed the ruling ruling point. That was the shift from the Greek domination to the Roman domination. But the ancient Rome was as well uh, something like uh, uh, Logos of Apollo in Italy. But the conquests of Rome of this of, of the Mediterranean space was the conquest of the Hellenistic world. And that was as well the shift from the Roman to Roman Empire on the late Republic as well, because that was that started long before the, the Empire. That uh, after the um, victory over Greek, uh, uh, there was uh, there was the beginning of the change of the Roman culture. And the Roman culture, we know, is Hellenistic role. It is, but Hellenism, it is Greek plus Iranian. So Mitraism, Roman Mitraism, and many other aspects uh, uh, were taken from these Hellenistic sources. And this Hellenism, Greek, Roman, Iranian, we all, always should remember, Greek, Roman, Iranian, Hellenism, in Roman version, uh, was ex uh, that were expanded, expanded to the northern, western Europe, to the Balkans, and Roman conquests in cultural way, in cultural uh, dimension, uh, were Hellenistic. That was uh, the Roman soldiers brought Hellenism everywhere they 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 come. So, uh, important uh, aspect of, uh, and uh, what was Hellenism? Hellenism, once more, was Logos of Apollo in Greek Platonic, Plat Platonic tradition, Logos of Dionysus and Greek mystery, uh, mysteriosophic, uh, the, the, uh, um, as well Heraclitian uh, tradition, uh, Logos of Apollo. Apollo in Iranian version, in dualistic version, with time, with the uh, concept of uh, uh, war of light, with Messiah, Messiah's catology, and no Logos of Sibylle. The Logos of Sibylle was present because in, in, the, in the depth of this existential space, but was not represented clearly. Only maybe in some Pergam and some uh, is a history of the Sibyl's prophecy in order to overcome Car Carthago uh, to put the black black uh, stone of uh, Sibylle from Phrygia to Rome. In uh, but that was more or less marginal. There was a kind of matriarchal uh, cult in Roman, uh, in Hellenistic Empire, but they were not dominating. The dominating culture was uh, Apollonian, uh, Greek Apollonian, Iranian Apollonian, and Greek Dionysian. But uh, precisely this Hellenism was Roman Empire culture. And that was Christianity, because the Christianity was constructed over this space and that has continuation, logical continuation of the same culture, crystallization of the Hellenism in Roman, Greek, 
version. An Iranian aspect in Christianity was crucial. That's important. Tomorrow we will develop this point. But now we see this Roman, uh, uh, Roman Hellenism with domination of uh, Logos of Apollo. That was conserved uh, with some aspect of uh, Dionys Dionysian uh, culture up to mo modernity. The Latin Logos, the Logos of uh, Roman Logos, uh, Roman Empire Logos, is Hellenistic, is Roman in, in, the, in the, its uh, deepest aspect, but Hellenistic, and, uh, 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 so Greek or Iranian in the next level, and that was the, um, the uh, with some aspect of dualism, that is Roman culture was more stressed and accentuated than in Byzantium. Uh, Christianity. So uh, Saint Augustine was Manichaean in his uh, use, and Manichaeism is the form of Iranism. Iranism it is dualism and so on. So there is something Manichaean and Iranistic in Rome a little more than in Byzantium, where there is balance much more Dionysian, uh, not so or uh, not dualistic Platonism in Byzantium and dualistic Platonism in uh, uh, Rome. Uh, in the Latin and Catholicism, uh, uh, comparing with Orthodoxy. So there is, but nevertheless, the Roman Catholic Empire was based on the Logos of Apollo, with more dualistic, maybe less Dionysian, but at the same time purely in the European. And that was the destiny of Italy up to the last, last uh, time. So, conserve this Logos of Apollo was a kind of, um, uh, of moment of Naamachia for Italy, to be the place where the Rome uh, was, to be the center of the Roman Empire, to be invaded by the, as well, German uh, and the European uh, tribes, to create a new state, but stay true to the, this uh, Christian uh, uh, in Catholic uh, version um, source uh, to this kind of Christianized Hellenism up to the end. And the last form of this in the very modernized and perverted way was the Italian fascism. That was continuation of this Apollonian attitude, vertical hierarchy in uh, the modern version, but that was the kind of uh, straight line. So the, the, the fashion was the, the Italian fashion was the last last sound of the city. Before that was the uh, 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 Trident Council, where the Catholicism uh, refused to go in the Protestant way. So defense of this Catholic identity or Apollonian Roman identity, that was the kind of destiny of the Italian existential horizon. So, and that is very, what is interesting, that uh, uh, that was not only caricatural uh, in the fascism. There were a caricatural aspect of Roman tradition in fascism, absolutely, as uh, everything in modernity is, is caricatural. But uh, at the same time, there was something uh, logical, continuation of this Roman tradition in a very special way, but continuation and get back. Uh, next uh, exist, uh, existential horizon of Europe, uh, Fra France. That is Celtic, Celt tradition. What is particularity of Celt uh, uh, existential horizon? The power of the feminine principle, the power of mother. So Celt tradition is uh, has fresh um, roots of matter. Uh, so, their uh, Celt Christianity was uh, much more feminist uh, friendly. Uh, there are many, uh, many legends and myths about uh, the island of mothers, and uh, the death was uh, considered uh, to be feminine, and uh, maybe partly 
um, uh, the Middle Age, uh, the tradition of uh, knights of Middle Age with um, uh, the cult of Amor, the love, uh, was based on these Celt traditions. Uh, there is uh, Denis de Rougemont, the author, very interesting, that tries to, uh, to, to follow, to study the sources. Denis de Rougemont, uh, uh, he has written the book that is called The Love uh, and the West, L'Amour et l'Occident, uh, where, uh, where he, he studied uh, the sources and the roots of the tradition of, of, of glorifying love in the, um, uh, the knights' uh, culture, the culture of uh, knights of, uh, uh, in the Middle Ages. So that was as well Celt influence with very strong presence of uh, um, uh, Great Mother. I, have, uh, the, I, have, I, I gave the name for the book on French culture, uh, French Logos, Orpheus and Melusina. Melusine that was the name for the fairy, uh, the, the fairy that was a dragon, uh, 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 feminine dragon, uh, woman dragon in uh, Celt mythology. So that was, and Orpheus uh, as well uh, was the figure, Thracian by origins, very, uh, very important for French culture and Celt culture because the idea to go down to the center of the hell in order to save or, the, the, or, or to meet with the feminine principle that resides in the center of the hell, that is a kind of destiny of the of, of French culture uh, in the best uh, aspect and the worst uh, aspect. So that was the kind of journey to the center of the earth in order to discover the uh, the, the femininity, the, the, uh, um, uh, the mother. So, uh, German Logos uh, was quite different from Celt. It was uh, heroic, it was warrior, and it was Apollonic, and that was the fight, a little bit as in the Iranian uh, case, against the ketonic, ketonic uh, power. So, that is uh, everlasting fight. So to be German, it is to it is the same as to fight. The German fights against the um, serpents, against dragons, against everybody else uh, uh, around. So uh, that is paranoid type. If you remember uh, Gilbert Durand, paranoid type of culture, but strongly patriarchal, uh, with analogenia. Uh, as relations with Valkyrians. So German uh, women are more like German men, they are uh, the same, so they are fighting, they are Brunhildas. Uh, so that is um, a, a kind of uh, heroic uh, society uh, uh, and destiny it is defied against, uh, against Titans. But when the Germans follow this this, uh, this, um, this destiny, their destiny, they fight so sincerely that they could not uh, remark the moment where their fight becomes titanic itself. The, they fight so much and so uh, devotedly to the fight that uh, it overcome some natural limits and overcoming the natural limits is something titanic. So they, they be, begin to destroy themselves, to destroy everybody else around them. So they, uh, and the, the Hitler, that, that, uh, the titanic aspect of truly Germanic spirit is clear. That was good idea to create great Germany, but that was not so good idea to destroy everything and afterwards Germany itself with this uh, overmeasure. There is the Greek term hubris, very important, hubris, uh, Greek term, that means absence of measure. So if, for example, you kill in the fight the enemy, that is good for heroic efforts. But if you 
uh, violate child, for example, his child, in order to, to continue in this, that is hubris. That, that, that happens. But that is not considered to be heroic, too much heroic, or uh, rape the women. It is always, always the part of the war, but that is hubris. Maybe in a certain situation, hubris in the other not, but there is uh, the uh, overcoming natural borders. So, uh, and uh, in the uh, German case, we see this warrior, warrior spirit, purely uh, Apollonian, that sometimes overcome its border and the, the enemies of the Titans become Titans themselves. So they're trying to, to overcome the other, they, they, they change their roles in the history. So being fighters of the sky against the earth, they begin to fight the earth in tonic uh, way. There was a very important idea in Iranian tradition that the, the army of light is weaker than army of darkness. So, uh, and the, the defeat of the army of light, it is necessary element of resurrection and the final, final um, victory. So, that is very metaphysical aspect. So, in order to, 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 to win, you should, you should um, undergo defeat with the light. If the light should die, it's better to die with the light than to, to win with the darkness. So the, the force is not the, the last word. The last word is the truth or, or the light. So the idea is... Mm, is it okay? Uh, the idea is that um, um, in the, when we pass over some measures, some borders, some limits, uh, and if we fight too much, uh, so we could destroy everything. That is German destiny, and that is German logos. And in case of Protestantism, that was in the, in, in the beginning, that was a very important idea that Christ is something inner, not only outer, not only uh, belonging to the cult, not only going from outside. Christ got, comes from within. That was the original idea of uh, uh, Protestantism. And, it, uh, and Platonicism and German mystics of Master Eckhart uh, were inside, were the center of the early Protestantism. But without measure, being brought to the hubris in titanic way, that becomes something completely different. The individualism, rationalism, absence of mystery, uh, absence of um, uh, humility in front of gods, that was heroic, Arianism, a kind of return to the Arianism, that was the Protestantism, that was as well German, in the best and the worst aspect. So, uh, Protestantism is titanic version of Christianity because Catholicism and uh, uh, Orthodoxy uh, they are Apollonian uh, version of uh, Christianity but modern Protestantism, Calvinism above all and the radical version of Protestantism are not so Christian or, or they are titanic versions. So, uh, England and the uh, uh, British horizon. My, uh, when I studied the um, British history, the uh, English history, I have arrived to the conclusion that I could not name, call the book dedicated to the English, the English Logos, because I, I, I didn't find the English Logos. But I have discovered the profound duality of English culture. There was the Celt Pole, represented by Welsh, by uh, Ireland, by Scotland, uh, that is part of the Celt world and Celt 
existential horizon, so the part of the France in some way, uh, with the same fascina fascination, fascination of the feminine principle, of the same uh, uh, descent to the uh, hell, uh, to the same black romanticism uh, and so on. And self uh, part is not only Irish uh, or Scottish, that was as well in Wales and inside of English society. So uh, uh, Stuart's dynasty was Celt. So the Celtic elements, uh, they, uh, they are inside of English identity, not outside. Outside are the radical aspects in uh, Ireland, in the Scotland and Wales, but uh, the majority of, of, of the population of the British island were Celt, were Germanized uh, Celt. The other part, the other pole, is German. So the mixture of Celt and German elements didn't create new logos, didn't create new existential horizon, they create uh, English schizophrenia. So, bipolarity, so there is a kind of uh, unbalanced mixture between German and Celt, and that was not a kind of synthesis, that was a very, uh, a very ill mixture or confusion of uh, contradictory elements. They didn't create the united logos. They didn't create united identity, they create bipolar, bipolar society. Very, very, um, uh, very, very uh, troubled inside. And there is the other example of the relations between Celt and German identity. The Switzerland, uh, Belgium and all the, uh, uh, the heritage of Lothar. The, the third, third uh, heritage of uh, um, the Charles uh, the Great, and in Switzerland there is very very thin balance between both identities. There is no so much synthesis, but there is harmonization. And what we see in England, in England there is absolutely disharmony, absence of any harmony. There is very very aggressive German part and, and very, very depressive uh, Celt uh, uh, part. They don't form the whole, some, something holistic, something, something inter integral. They form bipolar entity with deep, deep conflict inside that could not be resolved innerly, so it expanded. As British Empire, so it was expanded as a kind of um, uh, explosion of these two contradictory identities. That they didn't create the laws; they create a British Empire, capitalism, imperialism, liberalism. But all that—that that is. It is not, uh, uh, if, uh, for example, Celt Logos, French Logos, is much more Dionysian, Dionysian with many aspects of the Black Dion Dionysus. If German Logos is um, Apollonian, with possibility to, to, to change the situation to the Titanic aspect, um, English culture, English identity took the Black Dionysus and titanic aspect of German logos united them in a very in a very conflictual way and expanded over the planet. So that was the kind of mm -hmm. the, uh, not colonialism but colonization of illness uh, that wasn't cured inside and that couldn't be cured uh, and that is manifested in the main myth of England the fight of two dragon, the red dragon and white dragon. That was the beginning of the England, the history of England, the, the, the fight of black 
uh, of uh, red and white dragons. Red dragon uh, represented Celt identity, and white dragon represents uh, German identity. And they are still fighting. They are still fighting these two dragons, and uh, the e explosion of British Empire didn't change anything, didn't cure English mind. So English mind rests ill, uh, bipolar, but now it, it is obliged to, to, to return to this fight, to fight that wasn't, mm, wo that, that never, never ends. But that is a very interesting idea. There is no laws. In France, we could uh, identify the laws. In Germany, we could identify the laws. In Italy, in, in Greece, uh, in, in other countries, not in, um, in uh, uh, England. So there is a kind of American laws, North American laws. If, um, um, for example, uh, South America is the continuation of the Latin laws with uh, Apollonian structure, and that uh, embedded uh, pre-European population, not without the problems, but that was a synthesis. And Anglo-Saxon, Anglo-Saxons, brought to the North America their illness. They tried, they, they began, began to destroy the Indians, not integrate them in their society, and they created full, absolutely uh, a, a absolutely ill American North American society as continuation of the same of, of the same problem, but there is a kind of American logos uh, in pragmatical philosophy. There is a kind of solution for them, uh, and uh, pragmatism uh, is American North American philosophy. The main uh, I identify that as a main that is common wisdom, main trend in American philosophy. But what is pragmatism? It is the idea that there is no normative knowledge about subject, there is no normative knowledge about object, but only there is interaction in practice. If the, something works, it is. If something doesn't work, maybe next time. So there is no, no concept of what subject or object should be. What should be matter, uh, the, uh, the nature, the cosmos, or human soul? We could pretend to be everybody. Elvis Presley, Martians, uh, Anglo-Saxon, uh, everybody. So, if it works, so nice. If it doesn't work, it's bad for you. So, we could treat the world in any way we want. So, that is kind of pragmatical freedom. So interaction, that is, be, that is why American philosophers try to adapt Heidegger uh, in their pragmatist way. It's not Heidegger, but it's American reading of Heidegger, precisely because they believe only in what is between, what is interaction, practical. If you could, for example, if you are constructing the time machine in order to return to the other time, uh, you are free to do that, because doing that, something could happen. Maybe not return to the time, but, but you could discover some elements or some uh, knowledge to, to, to sell something or a new bottle for Coca-Cola. Uh, so you are completely free to do what, whatever you want because there are no limits of object or subject. There is no inner, no outer. It's only interaction. And interaction is practical and pragmatical. If it's, it's good to you, that is American logos, very special, it's not Anglo-Saxon, it is the other kind. And now, in uh, globalist uh, uh, time, there is the kind of loss of this logos, because America could not pretend to be colonialistic, because colonialism is the goal, is clearly defined goal. So now America, America is not anymore American. They are independent of some other, other groups. American logos is not so. It is pragmatism that couldn't tolerate any goal. So they could act, they could something happen, something doesn't happen. You could feel yourself um, uh, happy or not. 
but you could try everything. You shouldn't prescribe. So, for example, political uh, to uh, anybody, nothing. Political correctness is anti-American, anti-pragmatic. So you should not say. So you should say. You can say everything and act how you like, and make the monuments you prefer, or, or not, not not have any monuments at all, because there is nothing inside or outside, only in the interaction. So that is pure American best or worse, but that is American pragmatism laws. Now America, North America is not not such, it is different. So uh, that is analysis more or less of the different, uh, different uh, existential horizons or cultural space of European civilization. And uh, we could say, I could, uh, have already said uh, some words about uh, Slavs. We are uh, uh, in the European society. We, um, the last uh, centuries, we are under um, great influence of the West. So we partly, we share with Germans, with French, with Britons, with Greek, with Latins, the, their problem, uh, having some special, you know, special features, we will, uh, we, will, um, uh, we will dedicate to Serbian identity special lecture, so I don't want to anticipate too much, but uh, the idea is that um, uh, uh, what about our Slavic laws? Uh, it is possible it, uh, it uh, has uh, clearly, it is the part of Hellenistic uh, uh, cultural space because all the other uh, identities they have described are a kind of result of this Hellenistic, Christian Hellenism um, in, different, in, different, uh, in different combination. But uh, what is as well clear that we have not such uh, Slav, Slavic logos as something already made uh, or something completed. So it is the most interesting thing that is challenge for us. Uh, that is open logos. I have studied the possibility of the Russian uh, philosophy basing uh, on Heidegger and special book. Uh, I didn't yet uh, written the, the, um, the, uh, the last uh, book of uh, Naumachia that will be dedicated to Russian Logos, or to uh, possible or not, but dealing with Eastern European Slavic uh, tradition, I, uh, I, I see clear that the Slavic Logos is possible Sometime in the history, we approached it. We were very close to it. In the Dushan, uh, the, the great, the strong in your uh, history, with uh, the first and the second Bulgarian kingdom in the history of Bulgarians. Uh, we were close sometime in the uh, uh, Polish, uh, uh, Polish kingdom with uh, Lithuanian, uh, with uh, great Moravia as well with some philosophical tendency, uh, but uh, we never, achieve, we, 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 never we, we have never achieved the final version of this Logos in uh, Eastern Europe as well in Russia. So uh, 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 we, we didn't achieve the final version of Logos of our existential, our existential horizon is um, not finished, it's not, uh, it hasn't uh, received the last form, and that maybe is our challenge, historical, and Slavophiles, Slav Slavophile thinkers, they saw that we came to the history later uh, than the other, uh, when there is already a, a huge uh, building of German philosophy and German political history, French philosophy, Roman philosophy, Greek philosophy, and as well the political history. We Slavs, we have arrived to this a little later, not in the history, but 
to, uh, to understanding of history, to logos of history, to, to our philosophy. Our philosophy is a little bit childish uh, and fun time. There is a great example, great explosion of intellectual richness of the fresh, precious thinker as Niebuhr's uh, second uh, uh, metaphysical as well as Russian Dostoevsky. Uh, but all that is a kind of feeling of coming of our logos, not the logos itself. We are living in the anticipation of the Slav logos. So, uh, and when we study the past, we see many heroic deeds, but we could not say that is our logos. No, that is something like that. Uh, there is um, the Saint Sava in, in Serbia, that's anticipation of the Serbian mission. Of, of the history, uh, the creation of Neyman uh, uh, dynasty, uh, Russian um, Ivan the, the Terrible, uh, and the other, other moment in our Slavic history are anticipation uh, of Logos, not the Logos itself. It's my personal opinion, and it more, it's uh, more difficult to, to describe uh, our Logos than to, to study the Logos of the other. So, uh, because it, is, it, it demands a very deep introspection inside in our culture. So, but nevertheless, uh, and we, we should recognize that some centuries we were under influence of the other for example, uh, existential horizons, and they defined many things in our actual consciousness. But nevertheless, and that is always scientific truth, we have conserved our identity and the core of our existential uh, horizon, Slav horizon, uh, in the uh, in the same condition. Maybe it is it is uh, buried in in the depth, but it exists. It is sh sh surely and a certain example of the resistance to globalization. It is one of the examples. Yes, that was the the, the, the defeat, but. As well, uh, Kosovo struggle was as well defeat. Or, uh, and, but on this defeat is based the victory. On this defeat, on this capacity to 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 resist is based the future resurrection. That is the not only the death as the as defeat. That is heroic death. It's always promise of the resurrection. So, uh, 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 to, to say the truth. I can state very pessimistic state in modern Slav society, but at the same time I'm very optimistic uh, concerning the possibility of this loss. It is not yet done, it is not per, uh, completed, but that is the challenge for new generations of Slav uh, like intellectual elite that should make they should bring to the final point all the historical experience, all this historical, not historic, historical sequence of our onto, uh, uh, ontological presence in the world. So uh, I think uh, that we, we should study the cultures of other European people, we should uh, study deep uh, in depth uh, these existential horizons uh, to understand where we are, who are, who lives, uh, who live uh, around us, with whom we uh, have to deal, uh, who are oppressors, who are saviors, friends, and enemies. Uh, but most important is to understand who we are. But without knowing who are the other, we could not uh, de define ourselves. We should know, uh, know, knowing the other, we know ourselves. Knowing ourselves, we know the other. Uh, so that is uh, uh, so. In order to establish or re-establish or discover this Slavic locus, we need to study as well the locus or and the geosophy of European world, in the European world, um, and the other. So that is the importance of now my head. So thank you.
Oh, uh, questions. You, you, you had questions. Sorry. Okay. Please. Okay. So uh, you brought up an interesting point about German logos, which is uh, more, uh, let's say, a colonial in nature, uh, but it's also uh, can become Titanic over time if there is no measure if it's a hubris. But uh, I would argue, if I may be so bold, that the German culture and logos has become Sibelian in nature. Uh, after the defeat of Nazism, after that logical conclusion of Titanic struggle. Because I was in Berlin a week ago, and uh, nearly for two days in Hubert University we had a project. And uh, I visited the German History Museum. And in front of the museum you have a, I would say an ad, basically, uh, where you have uh, two leather-clad gay guys kissing, and the, uh, the text says, uh, in Berlin you can uh, switch or choose to see uh, how many, uh, as many uh, landmarks as you can, as many partners as you can. So you can you compare cultural artifacts with the number of people you can have intercourse with. Um, and uh, then you go to Ziga Zoyle, which is the statue of the triumph of, over the French uh, in the Franco-Prussian War in 1971. And in the basis of the tower you have an inscription which says, uh, this was once a monument to militarism, jingoism, and German nationalism, and now it is a monument to tolerance. Uh, and diversity, and uh, it was it was once a place where military parades were held. Now it's a place where gay parades and concerts are held. So is this a case that the culture is becoming civilian in nature? Uh, very, 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 uh, very uh, important point. Um, uh, we will um, in the lecture eight. We will discuss. We will uh, 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 we will make. No logical analysis of the modernity, because now we're speaking about modern Germany, yeah. and to speak about modern Europe, we have spoken about Europe in general. Yeah. When we will speak about the phenomenon of modernity, of modern Europe, uh, the, the, I am anticipating a little bit, there was the uh, victory of Sibylle total victory in Germany, not only in Germany and French. So, and we will, we will follow, we will, we will trace how it occurred, by which stages, where, how, what was the place of Germany. But you are absolutely right, absolutely right, about German culture and not only about European culture. That is the victory of the Sibylle, accomplished and almost irreversible. And the feminism, not is the beginning of it, it's the end of it. That is a kind of the final, final name that was given to the phenomenon that was already done. That uh, the, 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 uh, the, um, the the kingship, the kingdom of the Sibylle, uh, doesn't begin today. That it is finishing now. That is, it is a, a, a final stage. And uh, Germany after Second World War, that was clearly civilian, it, uh, uh, you are absolutely right, uh, but uh, the German National Socialism was the kind of preparation of that, that formally that was completely opposite. But in Titanic, or passing the measure, that, that was not so, so, so bad in, in, the, in the idea of to, to defend German identity, but that was perverted, was Titanic. And it was hubris. When the hubris is in the situation of the defense of the uh, patriarchy with hubris, it changes a little bit its context. And that is preparation of the uh, Sibylle that is, re is ruling now. You're absolutely right. Absolutely right. So? Okay.